Well, today we start uh, a little bit different than what we've been talking about in the past. Uh, we had, uh, this is not going to be related to the Old Testament or anything like that. This is going to be completely new. And it's my honor to introduce uh, Chandra Das. Uh, he is a, a monk. Uh, he is a minister of the ISKCON Dallas, which is the International Society of Krishna. Is that right, Krishna? Krishna? Consciousness. Uh, he was born in Hawaii. Uh, he uh, has been uh, a monk since the age of 19. He's lived all over the world, in New York, that's almost worldwide right there, and, uh, uh, India, London, and uh, he's in charge of a temple in East Dallas. So, Christian, if you will, give us your talk. We're looking forward to it. <coughs> Church or a temple, we have an attached restaurant, which is common for a lot of our centers. And it's a, it's a vegetarian restaurant, it's all you can eat, international buffet, and it's highly acclaimed. We win awards every single year. But the location used to be a Methodist church. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some casseroles right in our <laughs> And our temple room, our worship center, is extremely immaculate there. It's a beautiful wood card, wood, wood card pillars, the, the sky painted on the ceiling, and it's uh, really, really beautiful. But it used to be the gymnasium <laughs> with green cinder block walls and you know, basketball floor. <laughs> but it was it, after 15 years of hard work. Uh, they, in the 1980s, they transformed it to uh, the temple room as it is now. Uh, my name is, full name is Nityananda Chandra, but you can just call me Chandra for short. Easier. And so we'll be explaining the basics. Uh, it's a Hinduism 101 class. One of the basic things I would like to discuss at the very beginning is what is Hinduism? In the this is Dr. Rao, he's a member of our attempts. He also assists in our priestly services. He is originally from Bombay. So I'm very happy to have him. You're welcome. We'll, we'll do question answers if you have any questions for him. Also, feel free to please ask. Yes. Speak louder. Yes. Okay, I, I, I have a loud voice. I can hear that. So, one author, he wrote an article called, Who Speaks for Hinduism? Who's an authority? Who's a person who speaks on behalf of Hinduism? And one Hindu guru and a Sanskrit scholar, he wrote in a rebuttal article, For Whom Does Hinduism Speak? <laughs> Hinduism is a word that comes from foreigners, not locals of India. It comes from uh, those who practice Islam. There's a river called Sindhu. And anybody who lived on the other side of that river, they called them a Hindu. <laughs> they had difficulty with the letter S, so it just came Hindus. Anybody who lived on that side was a Hindu. So that meant basically everybody in India who was not a Muslim, they were called a Hindu. Now the thing about India is you have a variety of completely different religions. Generally, we would not think Christianity, Islam, and Judaism to be the same religion. Would anybody think that the same religion? But they're all monotheistic. But speaking about Hindu religions, you have religions that are monotheistic, polytheistic, monistic. Monistic is the idea that everything is God. Similar is henotheistic or pantheistic. You have traditions of different histories, different literature, and different theological constructs. 
but because they get along so well, we think it must be the same religion. India has a long-standing tradition of religious tolerance. Actually, in fact, the first person to give a foreign account for uh, his experience in India was a Greek traveler named Megosthenes. He wrote a book called Indica, which was written 3,000 years ago. Even 3,000 years ago, he accounted for the religious freedom that was present within the land of India. And so similarly at this time, there's still this culture of tolerance and respect. And because it's so tolerant and respectful from our, from our standpoint, looking into India, we think it must be the same religion because we don't see so much quarrel. But in fact, there are actually completely different religions. The largest percentile of religious group in India is the Vaishnava. Vaishnava is a monotheistic religion. The Vaishnavas, or the Vaishnavism. And Vaishnavism, the main sacred text, is the Bhagavad Gita. Has anybody heard of this book, the Bhagavad Gita? So Bhagavad means God, and Gita means song. And one of the very basic teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, this is the real 101, Actually, before, if, if this portion of this, this uh, concept is not digested and understood, then the rest will have no value. This is a basic philosophical foundation by which any other concept will, can be elaborated upon. Just like if you want to understand calculus, if you want to understand even uh, algebra, you have to know your arithmetic. Otherwise, if you think 1 plus 1 is 3, then you're going to be very off when you come up with your calculations. <laughs> so the first basic understanding is that you, the soul, is different from the body. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. It's not something you can sell. <laughs> it's not something, it's you. It's the conscious entity. For example, who here had to take biology in high school? And in high school and in college, we were taught that our body grows by a certain process. Old cells are replaced with new cells. Does that Everyone who's taught that same thing. Anybody speak a few words of Spanish? How do you say meat in Spanish? Carne. So, biology teaches that your carne grows by the process of old cells being replaced with new cells. So, it's not like a balloon, how a balloon grows. You just put air in the balloon, it gets bigger. But it's a process of change of karma. Correct? That's called reincarnation. If you believe in biology, you believe in reincarnation. The physical body you're sitting in today is not the same physical body you were in 20 years ago. <laughs> The body is constantly changing, but your loved ones still accept you as you. Because although the body has changed, you are not that physical body. You are the conscious observer, the passenger within the vehicle called the body. So that's your eternality, that's your sanatan. You're, you, you're, you stay you. Everything else changes, your body changes, your mind changes. You might have liked uh, cowboys, and uh, you might have liked Barbies, or so many different things. And now you like a nice, uh, comfortable couch. <laughs> <laughs> you have our desires change, but the person is the same person. It's like your 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 loved one, your your husband, or your your parent. They'll see that this is they'll. Even though the body has changed, it's the same person as there. Does everybody basically understand that point? 
So if you're not the body, that means you have needs different from the body. It's like if you're in a car and you're hungry, putting an extra liter of oil in the car will not take that hunger away. Or if you have a bird in a cage. Anybody have a bird? Birds are not so common pets anymore. <laughs> I don't have a bird. But if you had a bird in a cage and the bird was hungry, if you just put polish on the cage, it wouldn't help the bird. So the soul is different from the body. The soul has its own needs. The body, of course, it has its own needs. It needs food, it needs shelter. But most of the time, we confuse the needs of our soul with the needs of the body. Therefore, instead of seeking God and going towards God when we're looking for happiness, we think, oh, I just need a little more money. I need another couch that's really comfortable. You know? <laughs> I need uh, uh, a wider group of friends. We need more comforts for the body. But actually, we aren't the body. We're actually the soul inside the body. Any questions so far? So, religion, the word, has anybody heard of the word dharma? Dharma? Dharma and Greg? So the word dharma is not an easy word to translate into English. The word dharma has many meanings, but the main significant meaning is the essential quality of something. For example, the dharma of water is that it's wet. If it wasn't wet, you could call it water. The ice or the gaseous form. The dharma of fire is that it's hot. You wouldn't call it fire if it wasn't hot. You wouldn't call it sugar unless it was sweet. You wouldn't call it chilies unless it was spicy. That is its dharma. It's nature. It's essential characteristic. Dharma is sometimes translated as religion. Oh, in, in reincarnation, do you move power, higher if you live a good life? Conversely, I guess. OK. We'll, we'll get right to that. Thank you. Question. So the Dharma is something that cannot be changed. It's a central characteristic. Dharma is sometimes translated as religion or faith or duty. We find that once sometimes people's faith changes, but your dharma does not. So sometimes the word the Hinduism religion is sometimes referred to as Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma, Sanatan means your eternal occupation, your eternal character. So what is the Dharma of the soul? The Dharma of the soul is it has its eternal relationship with being a servitor. If we do not engage in our natural relationship of serving God, then we'll find something else to serve. Actually, we're always engaged in service. We serve our mind. We serve our senses. We serve our boss. We serve our husband, our wife. We serve our friends. Love is not be expressed without service. And if we don't have anybody to serve, we'll even get a dog. We serve the dog. <laughs> we want to repose our love in something. But that quality of service and love is only used and it's proper. It's only rightfully situated and fully satisfying when it is used in the service of God. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, ancient text written 5,000 years ago, Sadai Pum Sampuru Dharma Yatu Bhaktir Bhokshaji Ahai Dukhi Yabdi Hata Yayatma Suprasidati Which means <laughs> that the supreme dharma of the human being is to engage in loving service to God. Such service must be unmotivated not that we approach God like a slot machine or an ATM. Unmotivated. Like, what was the famous saying of Kennedy? Yeah, like this. <laughs> Change that. Government to work God. <coughs> and uninterrupted. 
not that, you know, I, today I feel like worshiping God. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll just, you know, go to the bar, I'll go to <laughs> clubs, and whatever. We'll, we'll, let me, it means it should be constant. It's actually, for example, here's a simple example. Just imagine for a second that both your hands grew a brain. And hand, right hand talked to the left hand and said, why are you working so hard? We work so hard, and all he does is get fatter and fatter. <laughs> Forget the stomach. Why would we need to feed the stomach? So you go to the cafeteria here, and take some of the delicious mashed potatoes, and you just rub it in. And the hands say, yeah, this feels quite nice. But does it get the job done? How's the hand going to feel in a week? You lethargic. The muscles will be aching. It will have uh, no vitality, pain. <clears throat> so when we try to enjoy separately from God, we find that it actually doesn't really satisfy our deep down heart's desire. But as soon as the hand feeds the stomach, it gets everything it needs. It gets its nourishment, it gets its energy. So as soon as a soul serves God with unmotivated, uninterrupted love, he feels happy and satisfied in all respects. There is a, another verse from that ancient book. It is Bhakti Parishuna Bhava Rakti Anyacha Chai Shachi Gade Kala Prapadya Manasa Kushti Kushti Shudpaya Nukasham. And anybody can actually appreciate this verse if they're theistic. Three things happen automatically when you put food in your mouth. What are those three things? Experience good. <laughs> Experience the, the, the pleasure of the taste. Nourishment. Something goes away. Hunger goes away. So those three things, and those things take place automatically, and they take place in successive steps. Eddie. The more you do it, the more you get. The more your hunger goes away, as the more food you put in your mouth, or the more you're experiencing the taste. So similarly, taste is compared to love. You experience the, the pleasure of having that loving relationship, number one. Nourishment is compared to knowledge that if you serve God, you become more conscious and aware of things. You learn how to actually treat not only God, but every living person, every living entity with love and respect. And number three, your hunger goes away means your material desires, your fever for, I want this, I want that, I need this, I want that, it reduces. You actually become happy in all circumstances. So those are... Just so the question was, reincarnation, so not only, of course, we know that, I'm not going to only speak, reincarnation means something in this life. Yeah, that is true. You can see that this person that's in the body is going through a constant change of body. Similarly, it's accepted in Eastern philosophy that at the time of death, one can accept, one will take another body, if they're not fully in love with God. One more. Can you recall on past lives? Generally not. There's some circumstances where people have been able to recall past lives. But if, if you're so absorbed about the thoughts of this life, just imagine if you're worried about your wife on your previous life. You're worried about the <laughs> Lots of stuff to worry about. You're given a fresh start, generally. There are, certain, there are certain circumstances that if it's helpful for the individual, they will be allowed to remember their previous life if it helps them in their spiritual progress. In fact, there was a great king. He had done his prayers and his meditations and preparing for death. He, was, he left his kingdom and went to the forest simply to live a life of prayer and meditation. He found a young uh, mother deer. He heard, first he heard a lion roar. And he saw that this young, this mother deer jumped into a river to get away out of fear of that, that lion that was roaring. And as it jumped into the river, it had given birth. And its baby, a tiny doe, was floating down the river. And the mother was actually just drowning. 
the king, he ran, he jumped into the river, and he picked up the dough, and he started taking care of the dough. And he fed the dough, he uh, nurtured the dough, and, general, and over time he became more and more attached to this dough, to the point that he was just obsessed how cute it was. I can just imagine how cute a little baby deer would be. One day, he couldn't find the dough, so he ran here and there, hither and thither. In great anxiety, where is he? Is he okay? He fell down to it in a ditch, broke his legs, and was on his deathbed. He looked up, and the dough was there, looking down at him. Whatever consumed your mind at the time of death, that fate you will attain. When you're consumed with thoughts of God, love and devotion to God, and you go closer to God. If you're 100% in love with God, then you have no business in this world. But if you're not yet 100%, take birth again. This king, he was a great devotee of God. Therefore, he was born. He, but due to this mistake of becoming overly attached, at the time of his life when he was supposed to become attached to God, more and more so, he became a deer in his next life. But as a deer, he could remember his previous life. Therefore, he would, at the time, at this time and age, there were many saintly persons who would actually leave their business and their homes in retirement and dedicate their life and life prayer meditation in the forest. They're called Bonaprastis, Bonaprastis Forest, Rust, if you stay there. And said, they live a very simple life in prayer and meditation. So he would, this deer would go where people were doing their prayers and meditation and the church tried to appreciate it. In his next life, he was born in a priestly family, and he still had the benediction of remembering his previous life. His name was Parat. This person is the name. If you have, have anybody been to India? Have you ever seen their, their rupee note? Mm -hmm. their, their money note? If you look on their money note, it's called a rupee. In the Hindi language, it gives the name of the country. What does it say? It says Bharat. The whole country is named after this person. He was a priest, born in a priestly family, but he was, because he was in anxiety of not wanting to be distracted in his, in his meditations upon God, he basically pretended to be dumb so he wouldn't have too much conversations with people who were obsessed with money, or obsessed with uh, sex, or obsessed with so many other things that would be distracting in his progress. He just engaged in prayer and meditation, and there's a lot of stories related to him. Uh, so yeah, sometimes people remember the previous life. Now, um, there are some philosophical <coughs> arguments, not just that, that support the idea of reincarnation in the light of an all-loving God. For example, if there's no reincarnation, why is there such inequality at birth for every human being? If someone is born in an atheistic family, is that not a handicap in their religious progress? Is it not, is it not harder for them to accept God, would you say? So isn't that unfair to take some to birth somebody in such a family? Or someone who's born sick. I had a half sister who died at the age of two. For what reason did that person, that child, suffer? What did they do? Because it says every sin, every uh, death is the result of our sins. So what did that child do? What did they? Why do they deserve to suffer? So born, people are born in healthy families, unhealthy families, people are born rich, people are born poor, destitute. Some people are born in atheistic, not only atheistic families, but a whole nation that's atheistic. You can go to certain parts of the world. And the concept of God is not even understood. It, it's really hard for someone to digest the understanding of the concept of a personal God. So, with the understanding of reincarnation, we see that a person who's an atheist in the previous life 
For God, therefore, God is simply reciprocating with their desires. He's not forcing them to accept his existence. He says, okay, you want to be an atheist? You want to remain, remain away from me? Be so. And those who are, have desire to understand God, they're born in a religious family or religious setting or they're given opportunities to further that desire. Like Mozart, he was able to compose symphonies at the age of four. It means in previous life he had some musical interests. The great uh, sitar player, Robbie Shepard, he said that the past seven lifetimes he's been playing sitar, therefore he's so good. <laughs> As Jesus said, what, uh, I, I'm not a Christian scholar, so he, except everything with a grain of salt. But he says, uh, from what I understand, he said, this Isaiah, he, or this Paul, he, he was Isaiah. There's, and so how are we supposed to take that? He said, this Paul, he was Isaiah. Any more questions? You had a question too. I just was wondering, when you spoke about Dharma, Yes. Concept. Is that, I've heard the word karma also. Karma, same yes. word? Same word? Karma, karma, no, it's completely it's different. different. Okay. Karma means action. <laughs> and implies Newton law that if you do something, there's a reaction for what you do. There's not only the instant you know, physical reaction, but there's a, uh, there's a <laughs> metaphysical reaction that if you're bad to somebody or you do something evil to somebody, it's going to come back to you. And actually, God's universal law of justice is called karma, meaning that we never, we're never a victim. Actually, what comes to us in this life are reactions to things that we've done. Therefore, we can be a little prayerful and meditative when something happens instead of pointing the finger, oh, you did this to me. Of course, they might have been the instrument, but does it matter who's... Has anybody heard the statement? Not a blade of grass moves without the sanction of God. That person couldn't do anything unless God sanctioned it. So God's protection is that we can't suffer something that was not in our debt, in our bank account. And either we can't enjoy something that is not within our credit. For example, there are many people in this world that are just intelligent as Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. But there's only... One Steve Jobs and one Bill Gates. There are many people who are just as innovative and intelligent, but it's not in their karma, it's not in their credit to get that facility. Sometimes the American dream is that you can, of course you work hard, you'll get something, but it's not that if you simply work hard, you're going to become a Bill Gates. It might not be within your fate or your karma. No questions? The, uh, the god of Hindu, does it have a name other than God? Yes, yes. So in the Vedic tradition, just, um, <laughs> so we have the people who speak Spanish. How do you say the sun in Spanish? Sol. 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 So if you go to Mexico, there is a big yellow hot thing in the sky that goes Sol. And if you go to India, there's a big yellow hot thing called Suraj. Suraj. It's not an Indian sun, and it's not a Mexican sun. It's universal. So the Eastern understanding is that there is no such thing as a Christian God and a Muslim God and a Hindu God. There's only one God. People know God by different names. In the, and a name of God, like in the Bible you have Jehovah. You have the name Adonai. Does anybody know the name Adonai? What does it mean? It has a specific characteristic to it. Anybody remember? <laughs> From what I studied, Adonai means beautiful. Beauty is an attractive quality, correct? Allah means most powerful one. Power is an attractive quality. Something that's powerful and, and influential is that not attractive. <laughs> But is beauty and power different things? They're different types of attraction. Now, if someone considered the name Buddha, name of God, actually Buddha was foretold in the Vedic scriptures 2,500 years before he appeared to be an incarnation of God. 
5,000 year old text, the Srimad Bhagavatam. The word Buddha means most intelligent. Is it not intelligence most uh, an attractive feature? Someone can crack really nice jokes? <laughs> That's intelligence. That's attractive. Yes, yes. Thank you. So these are all attractive qualities. And how many attractive qualities does God have? More than three, I think. So Mal said unlimited. Therefore, God has unlimited names. How many names do you have? You have a first name, you have a middle name, you have honey, you have sweetheart, you have papa, you have daddy, you have boss, you have doctor. Every person has so many different addresses from, based on different relationships. So God has, if you appreciate God in a different way, some person will appreciate God as being the most powerful, another person will appreciate Him as the most beautiful, therefore they address Him. But it's not necessarily like... It's an address of his qualities. It's not just like a general name. That he just has one name. He has unlimited qualities, and he has unlimited names. I don't know his name because that person was thinking God is the most beautiful. I see God and he is the most beautiful. So God has, if I, for example, in our Vedic tradition, literally in writing, we have over at least 15,000 names of God if not a lot more. Uh, I can recite about 20 just with the letter A. <laughs> Achuta, which means one who never fails. Achintya, one who is inconceivable. Adhokshaja, one who cannot be understood by the mind and the senses. Ananta, one who is unlimited. Adhyam, he who is the beginning of everything. Ananda, one who is always happy. A, letter A. Adbhuta, one who is wonderful. This is his letter A. Would all these names not be considered the name of God? These are all their glorifications. So God has unlimited names, and let's get right to it. There's only one way to God, and that is love and devotion. And that's what every bona fide religion teaches. That's how you connect with God. God doesn't need our bank account. He doesn't look at our membership. If we are a member of the Baptist Church down the street or the Methodist Church, if he doesn't uh, you know, bag us from those gates, it's based on what is the quality of our love. So with that, I have a question. What's wrong with this picture? Someone says, I love God. <laughs> People usually give good, cool answers, but one in a thousand will give the one that I'm looking for. Turning the five. How long have you ever gone involuntarily, not eating anything? A couple hours, maybe a day. <laughs> or forgot to eat or working or something. <laughs> How long? Anybody have gone without food? 12 hours. 24 hours. 24 hours. Were you hungry? Man. I was fasting for blood acids. I voluntarily. Just imagine, you're not fasting for any particular health or anything. Just the servants of circumstance, we had not eaten food in 10 days. The electricity went out. All the trucks that bring us food and all those things were not available. And nobody knows how to grow their food nowadays. That's an ancient science. <laughs> Just imagine, 10 days. So if we were walking up the street, do you have McDonald's around here? 
So we're walking down the street. Ten days he hadn't eaten any food, and he found in the dumpster a happy meal. <laughs> And I think about a Happy Meal, it stays happy for a long time. <laughs> it could be a month and it'll still look the same. <laughs> so would you be happy when you found that Happy Meal? Sure. So, as soon as you're opening that dumpster lid, and you open the bag, and you're about to take a bite out of that 10-day-old Happy Meal. Mal drives by and says, what are you doing? No, I make really good pizzas. <laughs> I've got five for each of you. Don't worry about it. Get in the car. There, come. He drives us to his house. And for some amazing reason, he has five pizzas for each of us. This big. Cut it up, 12 slices. You had eaten for a long time, so you're on your 43rd slice. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect crust. This nice fragrance, the ready fragrance of the crust. The soft and crispy. And the sauce is organic tomatoes and basil. And the, the recipe has been passed down for generations and just perfected. Sprinkled with so many different types of delicious, fresh cheeses. Parmesan. Olive oil, palo alto olive, sun dried tomatoes, and all your favorite toppings. Now your 43rd slice. Now, do you think about that dumpster? Any thoughts of the dumpster? <laughs> what happened? Your needs were met, right? They were satisfied. You got something better. A higher taste, something that was so much better than that dumpster junk food. Now, if someone is in a relationship with the most attractive, most beautiful, most intelligent, most powerful, most famous, most loving, most compassionate person in the world, would they not feel happy? They're in a relationship with such a person. Do they feel some pleasure? Then why would they need a cigarette? Just like the dumpster was a sign of starvation, it looked good when you lacked the 43 pizza slices. So certainly, if we still need something else other than God to find pleasure, it means we're not tasting our relationship with God. We're not actually experiencing our relationship. Does that mean we go to the person who's going through the dumpster and yell at them? Would that be of any help? You give them a pizza, give them the taste. So someone is still attached to things that are unrelated to the relationship with God. We don't condone them. But we help that person practice spiritual life in such a way that they can get a taste and experience from God by which those other things become pale in comparison. Just like the example of the hand, you put food in your mouth, what happens? Something goes away? Something goes away. So if you're really tasting God, pleasures that are not related to your service to God, they go away. You actually don't need those things. You become happy in all respects. You become saintly. We're actually meant to come to this platform of a deep relationship with God. We should not just leave the saints to be saints. We should also become saintly. Actually become happy and satisfied in all respects. Question, question, answer. Yes. And she has about your... T-lock. This is called T-lock. It's an ancient symbol, over 5,000 years old. It's made from the clay of the banks of the Ganges River. And it's, just imagine if you were going to Jerusalem, you might have this idea that perhaps a speck of this dust here has touched the holy feet of my Lord. So let me mark my body as a temple of God. So that's the same idea. And the haircut is a priestly haircut. It's called a shika. Shika means flag in Sanskrit. It's a flag of sign of surrender to God. 
Yes. Is that a book? Yes. It's a named scripture. Is that inspired by someone who's a mother of God? Bhagavad Gita was, for our understanding, this God was personally on earth in his own form and spoke it to his devotee and wrote it under his Yes. Yes. And this, this date has actually been verified by NASA. <laughs> How does NASA verify a scripture? Well, in the scripture itself, it gives astronomical events. Like if you ever study astrology, the sun is in Taurus or this, I don't know so much about astrology, but there's certain constellation makeup that, it, that there's certain astronomical events, like there's an eclipse, there's a lunar eclipse. If you get a few of those events, you can pinpoint several dates. If you have three or four of those events, only one date matches it. There are at least 20 different events described, and they all pinpoint the exact date. They even give the exact day and month, you know, month and day for this particular date. That's the date that the scripture says, but it also according to the empirical study of the astronomical uh, events, it pinpoints that exact date. Where you believe that God gave each of us certain spiritual gifts when we were born. And in the context of what you said earlier, on one hand, there's a very priestly person who dedicates himself to um, meditation, prayer, and on the other hand, there's Stephen Jobs. And he's using his spiritual gifts to make a difference. He's not a very satisfied person in terms of the status quo, so he seems to create new things. Yet at the end of both these people's lives, or at the end of both these people's lives, does God take Stephen Jobs and say, you've been doing some pretty good stuff there, but I'm going to make you a dog the next time because you didn't concentrate on that. This is a very good question. If anybody is a little familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is about a warrior who had, it's not like the, the wars of today, he actually had a just fight. It was clear cut. Religious fight. What is a religious fight? What is a spiritual fight? If you're a police officer, you see somebody beating up an old lady, it's your religious duty to go take care of that person, to protect that old lady. So he was in a similar circumstance. He had his, it was a great battle. It was called a, a fratricidal war. It was uh, relatives against relatives. And he had a, actually had a just cause to fight for. But because he had an emotional attachment to the people who were on the other side, he said, you know, I, I'm really, I, I don't want to fight. I'm, you know, there's my, my previous guru, my teacher. My, there's a grandfather of mine who's on, fighting on the other side. I don't want to fight this battle. I want to go to the forest and meditate and pray. After hearing the Bhagavad Gita, did he leave the battle? Go to the forest and meditate, pray. No, he actually fought the battle. So the point, another word of the meaning of the word dharma is your duty, meaning you learn how to use your ha your talents in the service of God. For example, if you are an intelligent or a wealthy person, that quality is like a big zero. If you're musically talented, that's like another big zero. If you're artistically talented, that's another big zero. You can crochet, that's another big zero. You can cook really good food, that's another big zero. You know how to do the moonwalk, another big zero. <laughs> you add God to the picture, you go to what in front of those zeros? They actually have value when God is in the picture. When you use your talents, in the service of God. That means if you're a musician, you should write music in such a way that encourages people in their relationship with God. Otherwise, it's just the same old, same old. It's called chewing the chew. It's like a piece of gum that's been chewed, and you pick it up off the ground and chew it. It's no flavor. It's disgusting. I mean, if you just sing about, oh, my dog, or I love her, <laughs> it's all been done. <laughs> and, and, it, and it doesn't satisfy the heart. This word sonata means eternal. 
How do you know something is spiritual? This is a good question. How do you know something is uh, not material? What's the quality of matter? Matter decays. It gets old. For example, <coughs> say Harry Potter. What's the what it's called? The most one? The, the Deathly Hollows? Yes. So if you could speak about that movie for three weeks straight for 12 hours a day, it would get extreme. Still, even a few hours would be quite rough. But if you're asked to speak about God for three weeks straight, 12, three weeks straight, 12 hours a day, like as a priest might do in a church, it will not get stale, it will never get old, and in fact it will become more enlightening, more fresh, more satisfying. So that's the quality of something that's spiritual. It's fresh, it's new, material things get old and stale. So when you add God to the picture, even our mundane rigmarole of work becomes fresh because we do it in the service of pleasing God. That means if you make money, you can give money to the church, because that is an educational institution to promote God consciousness, awareness of God, service of God. If you're intelligent, you can, intelligent, you can use your intelligence to promote the service to God. If you're artistic, you can use your art in such a way that it will promote service to God. <coughs> There's not an idea that someone who is meditating or leaving everything behind is actually more suitable. Now, it is, in the Vedic culture, it is recommended that when you're old, when you, your children are grown up and married, you should retire from business life and put a, a more intense focus on connecting to God and increasing your loving attachment. In the Vedic culture, there is there is the kingdom of God, and in this mortal world, you have <coughs> basketball. <laughs> so, in one universe, you have upper class, middle class, and lower class statuses of life. <coughs> Earth is considered middle class. For example, if you're a really good person, you do a lot of good things, you have some love for God, you feed the uh, uh, hungry, you clothe the poor, you've done a lot of good things, you've built wells, built hospitals to help people, but you're not 100% in love with God, you're not ready to give yourself to God, but you'd like to do good things then you receive the results of those things. You go to a place which could be called heaven. When your credit card runs out, like your friend is on a cruise ship, <laughs> he can't stay there forever. When his money runs out, he has to go back to work. So that's called Earth. There are places like Earth. This is temporary. This is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where you go when you actually fully dedicate yourself to God. And that's a, a, a work in progress. And you say you're a murderer, a thief. You've hurt so many people. Then yes, there's a place called hell. We have what we, what we have in America is called a correctional facility. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? It's for correction. If it's eternal, then there's no correction. There's no point to it. Rather just press to leave. So hell does not make sense if it's eternal. Now, if you're speaking to somebody, say, 2,000 years ago, and a not very uh, sophisticated people, just general people, and you speak about something like millions of years, then it's easy to say eternal, because they might not understand number of millions of years. Let me ask you a question. If you had to sit your bum on a frying pan for one minute, how long would that minute last? <laughs> so it is time is relative according to experience. So you can go to hell and you can be there for a hundred years, but it would feel it would 
practically be experienced like the many years. But it's not eternal. You go there when you're to pay your debts. And when that debt's taken care of. For example, say you're 80 years old, you live 80 years of bad life. Well, you can live 80 years of bad life because you don't you're not awake for 80 years. You have to sleep. So half your life, 40 years now. Well, when you're a child, you can't be accounted for for all the things you've done when you're prior to 10 years old or, to, or, or five. So then you, that's 30 years. But then in that 30 years also, you still had to have do like go to the bathroom, take a shower, brush your teeth, and you probably didn't do any harm during that time as well. So that's another 20 years. So you're saying 20 years, someone who was 80 years of a sinful person, and uh, 20 years of actually doing bad things, and they have to be in hell eternally? It doesn't add up. So it's a correctional facility. It's meant for correction. It's a reform. 